All right, welcome back for the Unit 8 Notes uh, Aquatic and Terrestrial Pollution for AP Environmental Science. In this video, we're going to talk about human impacts on aquatic ecosystems to talk about how humans impact aquatic ecosystems. <laughs> so um, if you guys remember back when we talked about ecosystems and in the environment, we talked about the tolerance curve. And essentially, when we look at the tolerance curve, we're looking at a range of tolerance. So the optimum range needed for, uh, for homeostasis is basically the optimum. Uh, and that would be right in here, the greatest fitness. Um, if you're outside of that range, you see stress, lowered growth and reproduction or death. So we actually can look here, for instance, depending on what conditions we're looking at, and this can, this can fit many different things. This could be, you know, amount of lead in the water. This could be the, um, the amount of oxygen available. These are all possible things that can exist, and typically we see a nice curve that fits where there is that, you know, Goldilocks situation in the middle where there's a greatest amount of fitness, and if you have small constraints, either too much or too little, you start to see um, that, that stress where you're outside the range. Now, when we talk about aquatic um, ecosystems, a lot of the times we're talking about coral reefs, and a lot of people think, oh, well, they're beautiful, and that's why we need to protect them. But they're also, they have other resources. They have other neat, uh, benefits that help us. So they're home to quarter to a quarter of the world's marine species, which is crazy. Um, you know, there are many marine species out there. It provides food. I like how that says provides foot. It provides foot to more than 500 million people that live near the coast. I don't know why they need foot. It actually provides food. Um, tourism, obviously, maybe not as important, but it is definitely important for those people that live in those areas because that can be their economy. They provide protection because they can actually protect from storms and surges. And we can find medicinal components in several of the species that inhabit these coral reefs to produce new medicines. So yeah, they're beautiful. And sometimes they're not. So this is human impacts, obviously. So you can see boat damage um, from anchors and chains, snorkelers. You know, if you ever go snorkeling in a coral reef, they'll always tell you, please do not touch anything because just touching it can contaminate it and harm that coral. Um, there is also blast fishing that occurs and cyanide poisoning that are all human caused. So. When we look at some other threats to coral reefs, we look at over harvesting because, you know, obviously it's a major source for food. If you remember, it's a foot source. Um, it's a food source. And if it is not uh, fished or, you know, harvested correctly, then you can have issues. So, you know, if there is indiscriminate fishing, which is where they use non selective gears like nets and traps, and they can actually remove fish that they're not trying to remove because eh, who cares um, you don't want to remove certain species because they help keep that ecosystem thriving and so it depends on where you're going so fishing too many big fish they will actually uh, reduce their ability to have young fish survive to adulthood so there's a lot of uh, problems that are happening and so it's really nice down at the bottom you can see some of the ways that you can help as far as uh, helping the threats to the coral reefs and this is from uh, NOAA which is a government agency um, for the United States so there are chemical Im impacts there's also sedimentation so these are two examples you know you have chemical impacts there so you can see coral bleaching sedimentation too much sediments can actually cause uh, low lower um, turbidity, which reduce or higher turbidity, which will affect the ability for sunlight to penetrate. Oil spills are obviously a concern, and you know we see many, we see more of these as we see more offshore drilling. There's also plastic waste, especially with microplastics. Um, microplastics can actually be very, very small. But they can interact because they can increase the mucus production. It's kind of like, 
you know, when you get something in your nose, if you're breathing in that harmful particulate matter, it's the same thing. These are like particulate matter for the coral, and so these cause problems like bleaching, overgrowth, um, and so there's, you know, obviously microplastics are becoming more and more common as a problem and something that we obviously need to worry about because the plastic waste that we produce eventually breaks down into these tiny, tiny, tiny microplastics, and we'll talk more about those with bio, uh, bio accumulation. We also see rising sea temperatures, which is causing bleaching. So this is actually the process of bleaching, just to keep you in mind. Remember, bleaching is not related to ocean acidification. Obviously, they're both related to higher sea temperatures, but they're not directly related as far as bleaching and acidification. So healthy coral actually needs algae to survive because it's the primary food source and what makes it actually nice and colorful. And so as the temperatures begin to rise and too much sunlight is being exposed, it can stress the coral and cause the algae to abandon it, which then causes the, al uh, the coral to bleach because the algae is gone and the coral then turns white, which makes it more susceptible to, to disease and death. Um, other toxins that are being put into coral reefs and into marine aquatic uh, ecosystems sunscreens and pesticides and metals so in a lake for instance you might have some illegal OCPs and DDT uh, entering the lake and then getting th in through groundwater which will affect the coral reefs to become very harmed so it's important to help yourself um, you can you can educate yourself as far as what kind of sunscreen you're using you want to obviously use physical sunscreens you want to make sure to read the label and read the ingredients um, make sure it only contains titanium dioxide um, and or zinc oxide because it's biodegradable uh, if you see the world word all natural make sure that you can actually see what's in there you know that they're not just saying that it's all natural and mineral based um, Oxybenzone is actually very harmful. It's a known endocrine disruptor, and we'll talk about that in the next video. Um, but basically, it's the most toxic chemical to coral reefs. You don't usually want to use sprays because spray sunscreens don't really help you as far as giving you uh, a good amount of sun coverage anyways. And they can uh, cause problems with inhalation. If you've ever used a spray, you know that it, you have to hold your breath while you get sprayed down. And then just cover up. You don't need to only use sunscreen. You can wear more protective clothing, which can help reduce the amount of sunscreen that's being introduced into the marine uh, ecosystems. There are also biological concerns because of invasive predators. You've probably heard of the lionfish. Um, the lionfish is an invasive species that is becoming very, very common, which is unfortunate because it is wiping out many other species that uh, rely on those coral reefs. So one of the cool things that's happening is they're trying to get rid of these uh, starfish, these invasive starfish, and they're actually using robots, which is just a neat uh, human engineering design on how they're going to try and solve some of these problems. Uh, there's also pathogens, of course. There's the black band disease, which you can see here by the black band. It's a bacterial disease. So as far as looking at natural threats, we have storm impacts, temperature changes, salinity changes, predation, and algal overgrowth. And so we look at how does human activity exacerbate or magnify the threat. So as far as storm impacts with climate change, we have more frequent and larger hurricanes. With temperature change, we have climate changes, which changes currents. For salinity changes, we're looking at melting sea ice, which is going to cause the ocean to become less uh, saline. With invasive species like aquarium pets and boat ballast, essentially uh, bringing an invasive species from one lake to another source. You know, if you guys have ever been to Lake Tahoe with a boat, you know that you have to get it checked. They always make sure that you're not bringing invasive species into their ecosystem. And then with algal overgrowth, we're looking at sedimentation from development as well as eutrophication because you get more nutrients, you're going to increase the algal growth and lower the dissolved oxygen in the area. Oil spills will coat feathers um, and the fur of marine 
mammals and birds it can obviously this is an obvious concern it's an obvious problem um, some sad images there from oil spills um, as far as fish with oil it can actually cause death from ingestion or from blocking their gills with invertebrates it smothers them and can immobilize them which causes them to be unable to move and then they die so some examples of some of those big oil spills, the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989 was when a super tanker crashed into the Prince William Sound in Alaska. There were 42 million liters or 11 million gallons released and half a million birds and thousands of marine uh, mammals were killed. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is another case study that we look at where they're looking at uh, getting oil in this area in Alaska, in northern Alaska near Canada. Uh, about the size of South Carolina, if you can see here. Um, opponents say that it's going to harm the pristine habitat and the human population as well. People that are for it, you know, say that exploration could bring in 1.4 trillion liters of oil and natural gas. So there are obviously uh, pros and cons to this and something that we obviously want to keep in mind. But there is... Um, an area here where they're studying and you have an oil field there's a national refuge the arctic national refuge here which is where the coastal part of the refuge is, exists and then immediately next to it there's an oil field and then they're looking at you know moving and exploring more in this area for more oil you're probably more aware of deepwater horizon because there's a movie called deepwater horizon starring marky mark uh, Mark Wahlberg. Um, it was an explosion at a BP oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. 780 million liters or 206 million gallons were released over 87 days. Uh, it's estimated that 6,000 sea turtles, 26,000 marine mammals, and 82,000 birds were killed. We'll also look at wastewater. Obviously, wastewater is produced by livestock op operations and human activities. You want to make sure that you know the different types of water. So there's clear water. This is clean good water gray water which is used water from baths bathroom sinks and washing machines and then black water is toilets dishwashers and kitchen drains the theory is that gray water doesn't really have um, a lot of bacteria in it and organic material whereas black water does if you've ever gone if you go camping you might have um, if you go camping in an RV or something like a trailer you might have a clean water tank and a gray water tank and then they also have a black water tank and so the gray water tank isn't doesn't have to be treated as much as a black water tank would so why is wastewater a problem I think it's not ridiculously uh, unknown but wastewater has a higher BOD which is the biochemical oxygen demand remember we talked about this a lot on the wastewater treatment plant tour so essentially more oxygen is required for the bacteria to decompose all the organic material. So the higher biological oxygen demand, the more oxygen is needed. So as far as the BOD level in water, if in terms of milligrams per liter, if you're at one to two, there's not much more organic matter present. If it's three to five, it's fair, it's fairly clean. Six to nine is considered poor, it's somewhat polluted. Um, there's probably organic matter present, microorganisms that are decomposing the waste. And then anything over 100 or more is considered very polluted and absolutely contains organic matter. The higher BOD means more pollution. So when we look at dead zones, the high BOD causes less dissolved oxygen for, uh, that's available for other forms of life. And so you get these dead zones. This is an example of areas in the Gulf of Mexico. So you see Texas here in Louisiana. Um, where there are different dead zones close to the coast because of what is being released into the water. So you can see here the dissolved oxygen level is what's shown on this graph and those dissolved oxygen levels are going to be very low in areas where there's a high BOD because all of that oxygen is being used. So this is another graph to show you the um, inlet, uh, the outlet, I guess it'd be the outlet of the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and there's a huge amount of uh, BOD because there are so many different sources. This is a good example of non-point source solution, uh, pollution because 
a lot of the pollution that ends up in the Gulf of Mexico comes from so many different places along the Mississippi and all of its uh, tributaries. So how a dead zone forms is pretty simple. As you have fresh uh, river water, this is in the spring, sun heated fresh water runoff from the Mississippi River actually creates a barrier layer on the Gulf which cuts off the saltier water from contact with oxygen in the air. So that hot air actually causes the salt water to kind of block uh, the contact of oxygen. And then so nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizer and sewage in the freshwater layer starts to ignite huge algal blooms and they start to come in which causes even more cutoff of uh, oxygen and sunlight. The algae die and then sink to the saltier water below and decompose and that dead algae is actually what ends up using up all the oxygen because the bacteria is eating up that dead, dead algae using the oxygen in the air. And so then all of the other species that are now starved of oxygen cut off from resupply in the deeper water become a dead zone. Fish avoid the area or they die in mass numbers. Um, tiny organisms that form in the vital base of the Gulf food chain also die, which causes, of course, a huge disruption in the food chain. Um, this is a great graph just to kind of show you a point source and that graph to give you an idea of the BOD versus the dissolved oxygen. We've seen this in a test question. You will see this in a test question again. But essentially, the, bio, uh, the biochemical oxygen demand stays fairly low until you get that point source of, of the pollution. When that goes up, there are pollutant tolerant fishes that exist like carp and gar in the decomposition zone. They're gonna be okay because they're bottom feeders. In the clean water, you're gonna see the trout and the perch and the bass and the mayfly and the stonefly. This is good fly fishing area. Now, as you go farther down, as the pollution is kind of being taken in and eaten up by the bacteria, obviously that dissolved oxygen is gonna just drop completely because it's being depleted and used up. So most of the fish in this area are absent now. There are fungi and sludge worms and bacteria that are anaerobic because they don't have oxygen. This is considered the septic zone. Then there's the recovery zone where you start to see that dissolved oxygen increase. These are again going to be the pollution tolerant fishes because the bio uh, the biochemical oxygen demand starts to go back to normal and the dissolved oxygen starts to come back up and then again we start to see those species that do well in clean water in the clean zone where which is what it would look like here obviously the goal um, of the clean water act was to prevent this kind of pollution from happening some other water problems lead so pipes were lined with lead there's also lead in paint and toys older paint and toys um, older buildings and apartments used lead and so you know this is obviously if you if you ha really want to get some of the history of lead poisoning in the United States there's a great um, episode on the on Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson where they kind of look at lead poisoning and the conspiracy behind you know keeping lead and gas because of the lead industry um, arsenic is another problem it actually exists in our earth's crust naturally but because of mining it starts to be released because they use it um, so this is a an average arsenic concentration in water samples collected in the far creek drainage basin and so you can actually see very specific areas where you have the tailing deposits and you have then higher arsenic numbers which then get into the water sources Mercury is another problem because as we burn coal and garbage, we release mercury. Once it's airborne, it falls into the waterways, um, gets into the sea, and our seafood actually contains mercury. Aquatic bacteria convert it into methylmercury, mercury, which is actually more, to more toxic than mercury, and it does not take much. Like this right here is all it takes to contaminate a 20 acre lake which is a US coal fire uh, US coal fired power plant actually makes 48 tons of it and it doesn't take much to pollute acid rain of course is a problem we talked about in our last unit so I won't go into too, uh, too much information on this but obviously we talked about acid rain as being an atmospheric issue because it does happen in the atmosphere but it gets into the water which causes more acidic water and pesticides 
Pesticides are great because they can increase crop production. The problem is, is those pesticides can run off into the water source. Pharmaceuticals and hormones are being flushed into the waterways, which is uh, kind of a problem. <laughs> so when we look at you know your pills and different drugs that are being released into the water because people just flush them, uh, it's not good. So in the production of the pharmaceutical industry, the distribution and then disposal is where a lot of this happens. Proper disposal is great. There's 450 tons from uh, that are properly disposed of. And if you aren't sure how to properly dispose of prescriptions, all you have to do is take them to a pharmacy and they will deal with them. Uh, but unproper is going to be just throwing it in the trash or flushing it down the drain or excretion because obviously unused drugs and that are unabsorbed and aren't consumed will pass through the liver and the ki uh, kidneys into the water sources. They can make it through the sewage treatment because right now there's not a lot that they can do in the sewage treatment process that prevents uh, the pharmaceuticals from getting into the water after they release it. And they can filter it but usually it gets into the livestock and poultry. So you always hear about, you know, there's a great case study of salmon in um, Seattle, in the Seattle area, Washington, that are finding high, high, high levels of uh, hormones because of the excretion, literally excretion, urine, that gets those pharmaceuticals into the water eventually. Perchlorates are also... A problem which is rocket fuel essentially these are the top 15 states with perchlorate contamination in the public drinking water system hey look we're on there we're on the map we're not the worst but we are definitely on the map and the reason we're not the worst is because we don't have that many people but we do have a high number as a matter of fact we have one of the highest PCBs are another one uh, polychlorinated biphenyls which are basically plastics they come from plastics and electric transformers they're oily liquid, um, very hazardous. It's a suspected cancer uh, hazard, and it can get into the water if it's released. So this is an example of electrical transformers that are releasing it into the water. And then there are flame retardants, which are PBDEs. Flame retardants are actually in almost everything in your home because obviously you don't want your home to catch on fire. So this is just an example of all of the different PBDEs that exist just in your home, you know, plastic, upholstered furniture that has polyurethane foam, which is a lot of it, home insulation, it exists in the, do in the dust, children are actually exposed to it more than, uh, more than adults because they spend more time on the floor and put things in their mouths. It's found in carpet padding and in some baby products. So sediment pollution, sedimentation, it typically comes from construction, agriculture, and erosion. This increases the turbidity, which reduces the sunlight, which can cause, uh, you know, basically lower plant life to get less sunlight and un unable to photosynthesize. It can clog gills and encourage eutrophication. So that is the end of our second video. I know this is a long video. Uh, some of these videos are going to be really short. Some of them are going to be really long. But our next video will be all about endocrine disruptors.